Oh, hi, Grinch. Hi. And she has kind of an aggressive attitude. Don't you do that. Don't you do that. Is it going to happen that, that one day we read a, a news article about you being eaten by one of these bears? Um, no. And you know, and it The remains of Tim Treadwell, 46 years old, a self-proclaimed eco-warrior and photographer, along with girlfriend Amy Huguenard, 37 years old, a physician's assistant, both of Malibu, California, were found Monday, October 6, 2003 in Katmai, area of national park and preserve on the Alaska Peninsula. After the air taxi pilot Willie Fulton, who had flown in to pick the couple up near Kaflia Bay, contacted the National Park Service and Alaska State Troopers to report that a brown bear was sitting on top of what appeared to be human remains near the camp. For 13 summers, Timothy Treadwell fled California for the wilds of Alaska, where he set his camp among some of the largest and most numerous brown bears left in North America. Treadwell gained national celebrity status after his appearance February 20, 2001 on CBS's David Letterman show, promoting his 1997 book, Among Grizzlies, living with wild bears in Alaska, along with his close-up photographs and video footage, often showing him within arm's reach of large brown bears or creeping on all fours towards a sow and her three cubs, talking in a soft, childlike, sing-song voice. Katmai National Park has about 3,000 of the total 35,000 Alaskan grizzly bears, the coastal version referred to in Alaska as brown bears, most of whom would weigh in excess of 1,000 pounds. For 13 years, Timothy Treadwell camped in several Alaskan parks, but Katmai National Park was a favorite, crawling and walking up close to bears and filming them, often attempting to touch both cubs and adults. In the 85-year history of the park, no visitor had been killed by a grizzly. Firearms are prohibited within Katmai National Park. Bear spray is allowed, however, Tim had quit carrying bear spray for protection several summers prior to his death. Treadwell often established his camp on or near established bear trails and intersecting bear trails. During this last season, Tim had also hid and camouflaged his camp at the Grizzly Maze within the thick alder brush in an effort to hide from the Park Service. Due to a new rule imposed by the Park Service which required all backcountry campers to move their camp at least one mile every five days. In late June 2003, Tim and Amy arrive in Katmai and set camp at Hollow Bay, in what Tim referred to as the Sanctuary. Amy returns to California after a couple of weeks and then returns to Katmai just as Tim was moving his camp to the Grizzly Maze on Kaflia Lake. Willie Fulton drops the pair off on September 29, 2003. Tim sent a letter back with Willie Fulton on Amy's return to Bill Sims, owner of the New Halen Lodge near Katmai, and wrote that a few bears at his camp were more aggressive than usual. Tim and Amy extend their stay one week in an effort to locate a favorite female brown bear not seen earlier. Tim also writes in his diary that Amy believes he is hell-bent on destruction and that this will be her last season in Alaska with him, leaving him for good, and that she was looking forward to starting a new job and desperate to return to California. As scheduled at 2 solar p.m. on Monday, October 6, 2003, air taxi pilot Willie Fulton from Andrew Airways arrives at Kaflia Lake to transport Tim and Amy out of the area for the year and is approached by a large brown bear. Willie states, it was rainy and foggy out that morning. After landing, Willie believes that he sees Tim shaking out a tarp and yells for the couple but receives no response. He decides to hike up the path from the beach and through the thick alder brush towards the camp after he notices a little bit of movement. When he is about three, four way up the hill, he senses that something just didn't feel right. Something seemed strange, hollering with no answer. Willie then states that he turned around and headed back down the path through the thick alders at a pretty good clip. And just as he gets to the plane, he turns and spots a pretty nasty-looking bear that he had seen on earlier flights, sneaking slowly down the trail with its head down. Just the meanest-looking thing. Willie then takes off and flies over the campsite 15 to 20 times in an attempt to chase the bear away, 
and sees what appears to be the same bear feeding from a human rib cage. But each time he flies over the camp, the bear begins to feed even faster. At 4.26 p.m., the rescue team arrive at the lake, and Ranger Ellis conducts a quick interview with Willie Fulton. Willie states that he could not be 100% sure, but was confident that something was wrong. Investigators combing the nearby area around the campsite discover what was left of Timothy Treadwell. His head connected to a small piece of spine and what has been described as a frozen grimace on his face. His right arm and hand laying nearby with his wristwatch still attached. Meanwhile, searchers excavating the bear's cache back in camp discover Amy Huguenard, whose arm and fingers had been exposed to the daylight when investigators first entered the camp appearing as though she were peacefully asleep, except that her body, like Tim's, had been mostly eaten by the bear. Later, as the helicopter was being loaded, a second smaller bear approximately three years old seemed to be stalking the rangers, and it was shot and killed as well. Video and still camera equipment also found at the site were later analyzed by Alaska state troopers, where it was discovered that the last remaining six minutes of videotape which was found still in the camera bag, had captured the sounds of the attack. The first sounds from the tape are from Amy. She sounds surprised and asks if it's still out there. Apparently, either Tim had asked Amy to turn the camera on, or Amy just turned it on out of reflex. At any rate, the attack was in progress when the camera was turned on. The next voice is from Timothy as he screams, Get out here, I'm getting killed out here. The sound of a tent zipper is then heard, and the tent flap opening. Amy is heard screaming over the background sounds of rain hitting the tent, the wind, and other storm sounds, all mixed in with the bear and Tim fighting to play dead. Seconds pass before Amy yells again to play dead. Not surprisingly, with Amy yelling and screaming nearby, this seems to work and the bear breaks off the attack. A short conversation ensues as Amy and Tim try and determine if the bear is really gone. Being trained as a physician's assistant, it is believed that Amy made her way to Tim and from the sounds caught on tape, the bear returns and Amy is forced to back off. Tim then is clearly heard screaming that playing dead isn't working and begs her to hit the bear. The sound of rain hitting the tent along with wind muffle the sounds at this point. However, Amy is clearly heard yelling to fight back. She is then heard screaming, stop, go away, or possibly, run away, as the sound of a frying pan is used to beat the top of the bear's head and the sound of Tim moaning. It is believed that at this point in the attack, the bear let go of Tim's head which the bear had in its mouth, and grabbed him somewhere in the upper leg area. The sound of Amy screaming very loudly as Tim is clearly heard over the sounds of the storm, saying, Amy, get away, get away, go away. Tim knew he was going to die at this point and wanted to save Amy from the same fate. Amy did not go away. The audio portion of this videotape lasts roughly six minutes. During this period, Tim's cries and pleadings can be heard for two-thirds of that time. He did not die quickly, unlike some traumatic death victims who were lucky enough to drift off into a shock-induced dream state. Tim was obviously very aware and struggling desperately to survive during the last moments of his life. 
Unlike what is portrayed in the movies, the bear is nearly silent. Only low growls and periodic grunts are heard, which only adds to the horror of the scene. Sounds of the bear dragging Tim off and the fading sounds of his screams indicate that Tim is being pulled and dragged into the brush and away from camp. As the tape comes to an end, the sounds of Amy's high-pitched screams rise to a new level, much like what has been described as the sound of a predator call used by hunters to produce the distress cries of a small wounded animal, which often attracts bears. Biologist Larry Van Dale for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game theorizes that Amy's screams may have prompted the bear to return and kill her. We can only envision the horror of what Amy had witnessed and heard. Hysterical and paralyzed with fear, standing just outside of the tent until the bear returned and attacked her. On Friday, October 8, 2003, two days after investigators first arrived and killed the two bears, a necropsy of the larger bear was conducted at the scene by biologist Larry Van Dale, where it was learned the stomach and digestive tract contained human remains and torn pieces of clothing. Four garbage bags containing human remains were removed and flown out by helicopter. The smaller, younger bear had been eaten by other bears before the multi-agency team could return, and only the head remained. So no determination could be made as to whether this young bear played any part in the deaths or the consumption of the victims. This incident occurred due to an unconventional person with unconventional behavior toward bears, camped in the middle of a very dangerous situation. Such were the words of biologist Larry Van Dale in trying to make sense of this tragedy. Tim's foolish disregard for his own safety and overconfidence dealing with bears in the past. Luck, really, not to mention his mistake of placing anthropomorphic values on bears and disregarding established federal guidelines when photographing and camping with brown bears contributed to both Tim and Amy's death. Grizzly bears are wild animals and should always be treated as such, wild and unpredictable. Not a pet or lovable cuddly bear. Tim would often tell listeners about the time he calmly defused a dangerous encounter with a bear by talking softly to it. When the confrontation was over, he claimed to have laid down and napped next to the sleeping bear. Likewise, in a 1994 interview when he was asked whether he was ever afraid of the bears, he responded with saying, they wouldn't hurt me. Now, now when you're with these grizzly bears, you're surrounded by them. They're very close to you. Is that how you live with them? Yes, I always give them respect and lots of room because, you know, uh, a grizzly's the boss out there. You, but you interact with them? Um, it's important that every bear knows who I am and that I fit on their hierarchy if I'm to survive. Is it going to happen that, that one day we read a, a news article about you being eaten by one of these bears? Um, no, you know, and, and it, 